now I have the honor and privilege of introducing our guest speaker for tonight, Laurel Portman. Laurel is a recent CWU alumna where she focused her studies on environmental policy and sustainability. She also obtained a minor in nonprofit administration. She has a passion for environmental justice and its impact on marginalized communities and intends to use her knowledge to affect positive social and environmental change here in Washington State. Laurel, welcome. Thanks, Jackson. And uh, thank you everybody on the SWAP team. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was a SWAP member, one of the founding members uh, of SWAP and am a recent grad and I'm just really happy to be back. So I suppose without further ado, I can get started. Um, the excellent title, I wanna thank uh, Dylan Gilbert for We Are What We Grow Through. I can't take credit for that, unfortunately, but it was uh, definitely an excellent title. And just for, oh, I already went too far. <laughs> for a little bit about me, um, I don't even know how to go back. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Anyways, um, I am a CWU grad uh, from 2020, and I am uh, very interested in environmental studies, environmental justice. And today uh, I wanted to start off by talking about environmental literacy, because I think that that is a very important topic and something that often is overlooked when it comes to talking about environmental studies. I think a lot of us are probably familiar with the idea of climate change, um, with the environmental issues that we're facing in our state, in our country, and across the world. Um, but one of the things that I think is stopping particularly a lot of uh, American citizens from fully grasping or addressing the reality of environmental problems is that um, environmental literacy is not where it needs to be in our country. Uh, for the students that are joining us today, professors, alumni, um, we have all had the privilege of having access to higher education. And that is not necessarily the case for everybody. And I think that, um, as you can see in the timeline here that I've listed, uh, the modern environmental movement started in you know the late 50s. Uh, Earth Day in the 70s. And then in 1990, the National Environmental Education Act was brought in by Congress. And that's not really a lot of time to educate the public. And um, environmental studies, environmental education, learning about things that affect our environment really wasn't a part of the K through 12 curriculum until the early 90s. And I will note that that uh, Environmental Education Act has not been updated or um, reworked at all since 1996. So um, <laughs> this is a very big topic and it's hard to kind of cover in just a few slides and in um, a short time frame. but I'll try and you know hit kind of the salient points and I apologize if this is uh, a repeat, I'm sure it is for many of you. Um, climate change obviously can still be a divisive topic depending on your audience and the current scientific consensus does show that the global weather patterns, climate variability, climate change, whatever you'd like to call it, um, is human driven. It's anthropogenic climate change. And one of the, you know, popular examples of environmental disaster when I was growing up was uh, the hole in the ozone layer, right? Everybody was like, oh, you know, there's a hole in the ozone layer and UV rays and it's, it's not good. Um, you know, today in the news cycle, um, mass deforestation is a big topic in the Amazon currently. Uh, desertification, which is caused by uh, poor land management practices, chemical and plastic pollution, rising sea levels, overfishing, unsustainable land use, all of these things are characteristics of large scale environmental problems that affect common use resources. So this is stuff like, you know, the air we breathe, fresh water, land, um, you know, fishing populations, populations of, of animals, and all of those different things is part of what's known as the tragedy of the commons. 
So the tragedy of the commons is essentially everybody taking resources from a common pool until there's nothing left. The main takeaway, I think, for the environmental issues that we're facing on a broad scale, um, Rachel Carson, who I mentioned in the previous slide, um, she was essentially kind of the mother of the modern environmental movement. And she says, in nature, nothing exists alone. And as removed as we can sometimes be or sometimes feel from nature, I think it's important to recognize that we are all dependent on the resources that it provides. And then to kind of bring it home to a little bit more of a local level, <laughs> um, environmental problems that are closer to home, like the Hanford site, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with in Washington state, um, the Hanford nuclear facility, uh, as recently as April of last year, is um, had radioactive chemical waste that has been leaking from containers underground and toxic chemicals from vehicles, agriculture, other runoff is affecting the health of our waterways. And that picture um, up above is runoff from Puget Sound. Something that often I think is taken for granted by people that have lived in Washington state for a long time, as I have, um, some things like our access to hydropower. Um, it's frequently cheaper and much more cleaner and much more clean than coal, oil, gas, a lot of the other uh, fuel sources that the rest of the country uses. And Washington state has some of the most pristine environments in the world, but we still do have our fair share of environmental concerns, just like the rest of the country. So for now, um, just so you guys don't have to listen to me talk the entire time, I would like to open it up and you guys can write in the chat if anybody wants to speak um, and just think of an environmental change that you have noticed in your everyday life. And I can start just to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, but one thing that I have personally noticed in the last several years is that we now have a fire season or a wildfire season that, that um, I didn't really ever see growing up on the west side of the mountains. And I'm sure on the east side, it's a little bit different. I think that uh, it's a little bit more noticeable over there and has been for longer. But um, these last couple of years, there are, you know, days or even week stretches where I can't let my dogs go outside for very long because the wildfire smoke affects them. So uh, I was just wondering if there were any kind of uh, environmental changes that people in um, the discussion tonight would like to share with us. Um, I guess I'll start, uh, but albeit a small change. Um, one I'm noticing that kind of my everyday life, well, the the day-to-day -day life of generally for the planet and society, sorry, I'm not used to talking, um, is corporations in the kind of restaurants and Starbucks and McDonald's and what have you kind of making the change to like uh, change their packaging, like, like not offer straws immediately, like do like do alterations to their packaging to be more quote unquote eco-friendly. Um, and the rise of electric cars um, is an environmental change that is still slow going because uh, with the, sorry, I'm trying to think of the word, like the adopt, adoption of electric cars, but it's an environmental change. I think that's kind of needed and necessary and I'm glad it's happening. Um, but that's what I would say is this is kind of like the effort to make packaging more sustainable and more um, friendly to the environment and the rise of electric vehicles. Thanks, Dylan. And then I see that Megan uh, mentioned in the chat that it's regular now in the summertime to have several weeks of high heat warnings. Um, let's see, Deanna, the drop in Lake Mead water level. Um, getting warmer much earlier in the year with less intense winters. Uh, Miles uh, Baker is talking about light pollution, so not being able to see the stars in the night sky or see as many or they're not as bright, which um, light pollution is definitely a problem, especially in bigger cities. Nick, fewer bugs in the spring and summer. Absolutely. There are um, a lot of changes that 
I think it's important, um, you know, I, I feel as though there are so many, um, you know, folks like say parents, grandparents, and, you know, they say back in my day, it used to be like this. And I think that it's important and it's a good topic to bring up to people that maybe are resistant to the idea, like, oh, like climate change is, you know, it's not real, it's overblown, it's, you know, wrong for X, Y, Z reasons. Um, but the changes that our, you know, elders essentially have seen in their lifetime, we're seeing uh, within decades. And, uh, you know, as young people, we're, we're seeing them before we are graduating college, we're seeing differences from our childhood to, you know, our early adulthood. And I think that that's a really important thing to consider. And then, oh, Rick, uh, tor tornado season in Missouri, much more intense. Yeah, I have a, a friend back that way and they would agree with that. All right, so moving on, unless anybody else has anything, let me check the chat really quick. Um, I was gonna say on the thing with the tornadoes, also the, the longer tornado seasons, because even some of the states are getting tornadoes in winter months where they've never had those before. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in Wyoming, and so seeing tornadoes in odd months is just unheard of, but we saw a lot of that last year, mm -hmm. which is really scary. Oh, and absolutely, and um, the, the deep freezes that Texas was experiencing you know, over the last couple of seasons has, has been more intense and has caused a lot of problems for sure. All right, so now I've kind of, you know, broad overview of, of the, uh, you know, environmental issues, just kind of thinking quickly about the environmental issues that we're seeing. I also wanted to touch on the topic of environmental justice. And many people understand, they can conceptualize the issues that come from abusing our natural resources. But something that is really often overlooked is the idea of environmental justice. And kind of building upon that quote from Rachel Carson, nothing in nature can exist alone. Um, environmental injustice goes hand in hand with social injustice. So discriminatory, discriminatory practices um, like redlining, which I'm not sure if everyone in the group is familiar, um, but it's where essentially banks, loan companies are denying home ownership and uh, wealth creation to black and indigenous people of color. And it was a huge problem, uh, especially in the 1930s is when it was um, really being practiced. And it has continued in many forms, um, but that also has dramatic adverse impacts on urban environments. There was a study that was done recently and it covered 37 US cities. And it was found that um, the areas that were affected most uh, by redlining, that they have a A through D. So A, B, C, D was how they graded different neighborhoods. And essentially A was, you know, like a nice neighborhood and um, it was easy to get a loan there. And D grade neighborhoods were um, kind of considered, you know, like bad, not good neighborhoods to, to be a part of. Um, and in those 37 cities, on average, those degrade neighborhoods had 21% less urban tree coverage than the A grade neighborhoods. And you might be asking like, okay, well, what does tree coverage have to do with anything? But um, trees, especially in an urban environment where there's so much blacktop and concrete, they have a um, ameliorating effect. They um, reduce the heat island effect, essentially. So you have the sun beating down, it's warming up the concrete, it's warming up the buildings. And there uh, are actually many public health impacts that are tied to the amount of trees in an urban area. So there are just a ton of health benefits that actually has been shown in several studies that um, tree coverage is correlated to reduction in crime. The higher the tree coverage, the less crime and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, the picture up on the right here where it says, we live here environmental racism is actually from a really interesting, um, it's from NPR and it's the St. Louis 
uh, public radio that they broadcast from. And they um, last year they had an entire series essentially on, um, oh, sorry, I lost my place here. They use their platform to discuss the intersectionality of systemic racism, housing conditions, and public health, health outcomes that were related to these issues of environmental justice. And so the first episode talks about two local artists that were working to build an educational garden in a neighborhood in North St. Louis. And um, they were essentially unable to, to do it and to complete the project because there was so much demolition occurring around the area that they wanted to turn into a garden. Um, they had a bunch of old buildings that the city was tearing down. And um, these, two, these two individuals were trying to cover the soil you know, with tarps. They were trying to cover it with burlap. And they were trying to essentially keep all of the debris, um, the lead paint, and the asbestos from contaminating the soil that they were trying to use for an educational garden. And um, this lack of foresight really is a huge problem when it comes to um, urban construction. And it's actually something that we've seen before. And I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the ongoing water crisis in Flint, Michigan. These environmental crises disproportionately affect Black and Indigenous people of color, as well as people in lower socioeconomic classes. Um, and in many cases, environmental justice and environmental health are very closely intertwined. So these people are in a situation where they are unable to move away, for example, in Flint, Michigan. Um, they, they don't have the resources, they don't have the money to be able to move. And so they are at much greater risk for very serious health problems. And uh, that's a, a big piece of environmental justice that I think people need to understand as well. And then I have another question for everyone. So when we think about the environment, environmental issues that we are facing, environmental issues you know, that our neighbors are facing, and the piece about environmental justice, um, I'm just wondering kind of what being an environmental steward means to some of the people in this group. And again, if you wanna um, talk, if you wanna throw it up in the chat. Um, I guess I'll start again. Um... I don't crave attention, I promise, but I had a thought. Um, environmental stewardship, I guess, means actually taking action, not just saying like, oh, I care about the environment. Oh, I love electric cars, blah, blah, blah. Like, but actually doing something to impact the environment rather than like recognizing the issue and not really doing much. Like, it's basically like, Environment, some environment, environmental activism is kind of performative activism. You can't just post a black square or green square, green square in this case, and do nothing else. You have to actually make the change and make a significant effort. Otherwise, what you're saying isn't really doing anything. All right, and I see in the chat, we have a couple um, advocating and sharing knowledge from Ava. Um, Jamie says recycling and Jackson says if I see litter and picking it up and properly disposing of it. Does anybody else have any any thoughts about stewardship? And oh sorry before I didn't mean for that to sound like kind of judgy or like negative or anything but I, I didn't know how else to word it but like I, I didn't mean to like offend or anything I apologize. I think also uh, contributing to the conversation but also helping educate people on the environment, especially in terms, I think there's a lot of like climate nihilism and this idea of doomsday. And there's just like, people become sometimes complacent in regards to the environment or climate change or the intersectionality of climate justice and social justice and racial justice. So I think the more we can have conversations and educate and then push that towards action that that's a form of environmental stewardship. Absolutely. And I think, like I mentioned, you know, right from the get go, I think that um, environmental literacy 
is, is a big piece of getting people to not only be able to understand and conceptualize, you know, their place in our environment, because I mean, our environment is everywhere, right? It, it is so intertwined. And that was part of the reason that I chose a degree in interdisciplinary studies, because I recognized how deeply interwoven all of these topics can be. I see uh, Rick posted oil industries and large corporations contribute the most. I think paying close attention to elections on all levels and electing people who want to hold them accountable. They're skipping ahead. <laughs> but uh, all right, so I'm going to move along here. And that kind of brings me to like, you know, the so what? What do we do? On the left side of the screen here, you can see um, this is just I pulled straight from CWU's uh, environmental studies program. Uh, I personally did not, I was not a part of the environmental studies program, but I did take several courses um, that had to do with the environment, obviously, for my degree. And um, it's, the thing is, is it's not hard to be a good environmental steward. And I think that that's a, a big point to take away from tonight. The problems that we are facing are immense, and there's no doubt about that. But there are so many facets of our lives that can lend themselves to being conscientious citizens and stewards of our planet. And I'd like to talk to you kind of about three different aspects of stewardship, um, what we can do as individuals on an individual level, what we can do on a community level, and then what we can do statewide and potentially beyond. So as far as individual responsibility goes, and um, if you guys want to, you know, go and bring this up, the image on the right is you go to um, footprint, footprintcalculator.org. You don't have to put in the end stuff, it'll autofill for you, but you uh, can answer a bunch of questions about, um, you know, all, all kinds of aspects of your life, really, like how much you drive, um, the types of things that you eat. And essentially uh, just a bunch of different questions and it will give you results on your personal earth overshoot day, which is if it takes, uh, essentially it's a calendar year and it would say at what point in the year um, you would deplete all of the resources on earth. And it will also tell you how many earths it would need or we would need if everybody lived um, the same way. And so that's like a really good way to kind of conceptualize um, just how, how we, live and how we uh function i have a question sorry yeah absolutely um does the 320 miles cancel cancel each other out if you if you drive the 320 miles to buy a burger i think it's actually addition i don't think it cancels i think i think it's added too okay <laughs> um but so, and then again, I would like to, to preface this section by saying that there is not any single action that one person can take to counter the effects of climate change. Um, the efforts of individuals are important and I don't wanna diminish that in any way, but there are um, a lot of large corporations are, you know, essentially the, the big contributors here. Efforts of individuals are important as a whole, um, but there, there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, but uh, individual responsibility is still very important. So I did want to talk about it. Um, so of course, there's always, you know, the adage, reduce, reuse, recycle, right? It's still popular. It's an oldie, but a goodie. Um, and it's important to be aware of, you know, things like the amount of waste that you generate, you know, or is there packaging on the things that you buy, what kind of packaging can it be recycled? And again, the products you use, things that, that um, I think, for example, like um, like a body scrub that has little exfoliating beads in it. You know, are the beads made out of plastic? Because those end up in the waterways. And then, of course, um, things about like the type of energy and the amount of energy that you consume. Just living your daily life, and that footprint calculator is really great for kind of conceptualizing that. And then I do love the eating one less burger per week, taking your car off the road for 320 miles. Um, it's not a popular 
uh, idea necessarily, or at least not in my circles. Um, but um, eating less meat and less animal products in general, milk, cheese, eggs, eating less of that um, does do a lot. As you can see, one less burger per week is the same as, you know, not driving your car and emitting all of the, you know, fumes for 320 miles. Uh, the same article said that if everyone um, reduced their meat consumption by, you know, one day a week, so three meals a week where you're not consuming meat, that saves uh, 23,213 gallons of water. So the, the amount of energy, the amount of water, everything that goes into animal agriculture. Um, so going vegetarian or going vegan for one day a week can actually do a lot of good. Beyond personal choices, there are a lot of things that you can do in the community to support a more environmentally friendly way of life. As students, of course, you know, you have uh, classes at Central that you can take. These are all, uh, you know, the undergraduate courses. So I apologize for any grad students. Um, but these are just a few of the courses that I myself took and really enjoyed when I was taking um, my courses at Central doing my bachelor's degree. And um, of course, uh, in the previous slide showing all of the different courses that are available, um, environmental science, policy, conservation, and um, also getting involved on the local level. I posted down on the right hand corner, the Mid Columbia Fisheries Enhancement Group, which deals with uh, salmon populations. And I believe if I read the, the listing right, that they are currently looking for an intern looking for an intern to help. And I believe it's with um, environmental education, kind of that piece. Uh, the Wild Horse Wind Facility is with um, Puget Sound Energy and they have the uh, wind turbines there and they're also hiring a, um, an intern. I didn't look into the specifics too much, but I believe it's also kind of a education sort of position, like getting knowledge out there about what the wind facility does and that is also a paid internship. And then another great organization is the Kittitas Environmental Education Network or KEEN, which is, um, they work with a bunch of the schools and this is all local to Ellensburg. And so I, I myself am in Olympia, um, but I know a lot of you are over in Ellensburg and there are a lot of opportunities that you can get involved in with your community, um, you know, essentially to make a difference. And if there are, isn't anything that necessarily, you know, interests you. Going back to our discussion about environmental changes that you might have noticed, um, you know, and, and even small things. You know, if you're driving and you see that there's a creek full of garbage, you know, organizing um, a student get together and and cleaning up a stream. Um, I skipped it because I went too fast past my first slide, but um, there's a picture of me working with the Olympia Parks and Recreation Department, we were um, eradicating some invasive blackberry in a park. And um, there are just so many things that you can do in environmental work because there's a huge spectrum when it comes to ways that you can help. Um, and then globally, it seems like there, you know, are a lot. Let me. Sorry, I'm going to pause here for a second and just look at the chat. All right. So Jackson asks, "How can I figure out if a brand is actually using recycled materials? Some companies will brand a special on clothing to be used from recycled material, but how can I?" prove that that actually is true. And then Dylan does say companies required to back up their claims. You can look into their social responsibility. Um, and that is very true. There are a lot of different ways that you can um, find out stuff about uh, companies that are claiming to have, um, you know, and it's, it's funny because, you know, it's becoming more popular, I think, for companies to, to have green practices. It becomes a selling point for sure. And then let's see, Nick says, I'm curious about the way we calculate and talk about the environmental impact of different foods and resources. We talk about the amount of water consumption of cattle, 
But what about the ecological loss associated with mass agriculture, especially with having non-local foods or foods out of season? And that is a super good point. Um, honestly, the uh, mass agriculture is definitely a monster contributor to um, emissions. And there is, um, it is important to look at local options, but it's not always available, right? And it's also uh, something to consider when we talk about environmental justice, um, like the idea of food deserts, right? Where there are areas, um, there are cities and, and towns where in order to go to the grocery store, you pretty much have to take a bus, you have to take a car, you have to take some kind of transport to get there um, because whether it's too far or the walking paths or bicycle paths are either non-existent or they're not safe. So there's definitely um, a lot of room for improvement in, in those types of things. And as far as making a global impact, um, sorry, I'm just gonna double check again. The chat is not opening up for me. Okay, so um, we've covered things we can do on an individual and community level to do better for our environment and be better environmental stewards. Um, and it can be hard to see how we as individuals can make a, uh, an impact on that scale. And I, I would like to say, obviously, if there is anybody here that's not registered to vote, please go after this is, discussion is done, register to vote. Um, because there are so many candidates that understand the importance of environmental issues and they're willing to go to bat for, you know, the general public when it comes to making things about, uh, you know, making these issues be addressed. And uh, there are, um, you know, some of the best and, and the greatest environmental safeguards uh, in the last century have been put into place by presidents and by Congress. Um, you know, the Endangered Species Act and um, protecting national parks, like kind of these wide sweeping legislative, um, you know, things and, and starting at the ground level, you know, voting even locally, you know, that can make a big difference uh, in the big picture. And then of course, have to include Greta here. I'm sure everyone's familiar. Um, and the great thing about the modern environmental movement is that even small community efforts can expand and, and they can grow. And you know what works in Ellensburg is absolutely applicable to other places in the country and to other places in the world. You know, if if you you know want to start um, some kind of environmental cleanup group, you know, going out with your friends and um, you know, I mean, even you know, with social media creating hashtags and you know the kids that were um, cleaning up streams and, and sharing and challenging other people to do the same on beaches and, and in their hometowns. And there are so many ways to affect change, especially you know, using social media as a tool. And I um, just would like to again reiterate that environmental justice issues are very much a part of that spectrum. Be an activist, you know, use your voices to call for change, you know, use the tools that you have available to you to write letters, to organize discussion, protests, and, and demand action from the institutions and organizations that you are a part of, because that's how it starts, right? And uh, that just really is a way to create lasting change, I think, is by taking the individual and community efforts and expanding them outward. And that was pretty much all I had for you guys. There was some good discussions going on in the chat and now I can access it. So um, I uh, guess if anybody has any questions, if anybody has any thoughts, anything that they would like to um, discuss further, then we can open that up. Yeah, um, we have some questions that we came up um, as like a leadership team. 
Um, so I can go ahead and ask some of those. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, and we'll get those answered for you. Uh, but our first question was, how did your time at Central prepare you for this future? That's a good question. Um, with Central, I think, so I actually started my academic career at Washington State University. And um, in that program, I was uh, taking their environmental science. Uh, that, was, that was going to be my, my degree of study. And their environmental science courses um, were very, I mean, you know, biology, chemistry, um, heavy and, and very uh, focused on the scientific part. And then um, I took a little, little bit of a break from school and then came back and did my online degree uh, through Central. And one of the first courses that I took after coming back to university at Central was about, um, I believe it was climate and social justice was essentially the, the main topics of the, the course. And it just made me realize how big of a piece that I was missing by solely focusing on the science. And so um, to answer the question, I think that uh, going to Central and, and being able to, to see that piece and, and to see how interconnected social issues and environmental issues truly are, I, I think that has made it easier for me to see how I can apply my love of the environment and my interest and my passion for it into really any avenue that I, you know, that I find. There, there are so many ways that you can take pretty much any kind of uh, job, any kind of, you know, internship or volunteer opportunity and, and turn it into something that is not only you know, for benefit of the organization that you're, you're working with, but to a benefit of the environment as well. Perfect answer. That was a great, great answer to that. Um, uh, Dylan asked in the chat, what would, uh, what would one do in a situation where they want to take action, but they are being suppressed and held back either by an employer or other factor that is stopping them from being heard and making a change? So I guess it depends on, you know, the, the action and the employer, there are a few factors there, but, you know, say, for example, um, one of the last jobs that I held was with the postal service, right? And so, um, you know, there are actions that, you know, they could take to, um, Essentially, I, I know one of the big things right now with the Postal Service is they're trying to move forward with uh, having an electric fleet, an all-electric fleet of vehicles. And um, I, I know that I wasn't personally a part of the discussions on that, but from the inside, um, it was a difficult discussion. I know that their uh, current leadership is still trying to get around it and not have that be reality. Um, so I would just say that in any job where you are wanting to take action for the betterment of the environment, um, I think it's just something that you have to kind of work at. You have to work at your employer, work at uh, your boss, at whomever is uh, disagreeing. And there has to be common ground somewhere, right? You have to find commonalities and, and figure out a way to um, move forward and make change. And from a business perspective, you know, sometimes it's uh, not the cheapest option. So that always hurts, you know, the business owner when they don't want to spend more money. But um, I think that a lot of people are open to, you know, being good stewards. And if given the opportunity, you know, I think that a lot of people will. That was a good question and a good answer. Um, another great question in the chat from Nick uh, says, how do you navigate the paralysis of complexity? So many of these issues have no clear answer to the extent that one's made of one another is still actively harmful. How do we grapple with best practices in a system with a very, very few actual best practices? That's a great question. 
And that's definitely something that we have to ask ourselves, right? Um, because, it, you know, as I've been saying this evening, um, the environment is uh, an extremely complex issue and it, it really affects all facets of, of our lives. And um, I think it comes down to, it's obviously personal choice and, and kind of from what in my personal life, I weigh the options. You know, you just have to weigh um, what, like, so for example, you know, I mean, something very basic, like, do I pick the organic produce, you know, at the grocery store? And then you sit and look at it and like, oh, well, the organic produce is actually from Mexico and this other produce is local, but it's not organic. So which one is better? And um, I think that that is, again, a piece that is really important to um look at through that lens of um sorry i'm totally blinking on my phrasing here <laughs> you think that i would know it uh environmental literacy so taking that environmental literacy piece is uh you know essentially we're we're at a point still i feel even though the environmental movement has been going on for what 70 ish years at this point the modern environmental movement as they're you know we're we're saying from rachel carson um but the the knowledge the education uh is still really it's in its infancy i think i think that um you know we haven't had legislation on environmental education since 1990 we haven't revisited the the rules and the regulations for that since 1996. I feel like probably some of you weren't even alive in 1996. So, um, you know, I think that I was, <laughs> I was too. Um, but I think that the you know the education piece of it is is huge. And so to make those choices easier, essentially, when you have such a complex issue, at the very least, we can try and give, um, give people in general and give ourselves, you know, we can educate ourselves on which of those choices are better, you know, and it's just, that's a, a really, it's, it's a hard, you know, line to draw. You just kind of have to ask questions and do research. I feel like it's the best way to, to work on that part of it. Perfect. Um, I have a kind of a double whammy of a, of a question here. Um, so when you're discussing uh, uh, different forms of justice, including environmental justice, it's important to also discuss intersectionality. Um, in what ways do you see environmental justice intersecting with social and racial justice? And on that same aspect, what are some articles or books or some kind of media that specifically touch on intersectionality with environmental justice? That's a good question. I'm not familiar with anything super recent um, regarding uh, books or anything like that. I will say that when I was, um, I mean, it's, I feel like the, the topic of environmental justice especially in recent years with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and, and things like that. I feel like social and racial justice um, is, it, it came to a head in a lot of ways during that time. And I think um, the worst thing that we can do is let that momentum die. And I think, people becoming more aware of the social justice aspect um, when it comes to the environment. So, uh, you know, some of the um, examples that I had tonight, you know, in, in Flint, Michigan, the, the people in St. Louis, and then, um, you know, there, there are so many that you can draw from, right? I mean, um, indigenous tribes in Alaska, for example, and uh, the pipelines that they were trying to push through, which I believe as far as I know are not uh, gonna be a thing anymore. Um, and there are, are so many, um, I mean, honestly, there, there are so many issues of social justice that also have an environmental component because it is so um, 
just invasive. It's a it's a pervasive issue in all aspects of our society, uh, the the racial aspect. And then you know when you throw into it the fact that people are having these environmental concerns, uh, you know, for example, and I'm totally blanking on the name of the island, but the island uh, in the Pacific that um, essentially is having to be abandoned because of rising sea level, you know, and people are being displaced. Um, and then people that, you know, are becoming unhoused for different environmental reasons, you know, um, from tornadoes, from natural disasters, you know, that is all kind of, it all just meshes together, you know. I wish that I did have some uh, recommendations for you guys. I, I don't unfortunately have anything off the top of my head regarding um, kind of that intersection of social and environmental justice right offhand. Well, if you think of them later, you can always send them our way and then we'll email them out as well. Yeah. Oh, and I see Kelsey, uh, intersectional environmentalist on Instagram. I, I do, I love them, I follow them. And then uh, huh. deeply rooted on PBS. I haven't seen that, but I will look it up. But yeah, um, I mean, I, I, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, uh, I didn't want to interrupt, but I have a quick question after your point. I was just going to say, um, and honestly, you can just type in the words, you know, environmental justice into Google search, you know, social environmental justice. And um, a lot of a lot of articles will come up. And I feel as though, like I mentioned with uh, recently, you know, Black Lives Matter and kind of these. Thank you, Deanna, for the island name, Tuvalu. Um, there are. Uh, a lot of people coming forward and, you know, saying, uh, you know, hey, like this is, you know, an environmental issue that I'm seeing, you know, in my city and my town and my neighborhood. And um, unfortunately, a lot of those neighborhoods are um, neighborhoods that were part of, you know, segregation, the, the D-class neighborhoods in um, when they were redlining and, and all that stuff. So, I think it's just something that can definitely be um, addressed maybe a little bit more openly now, um, now that, you know, things have kind of, uh, they're being talked about more, essentially. <laughs> anyway, you can go ahead, Dylan. Um, I have a quick question, and if this is off topic or unrelated, you can skip me um, and um, throw a stone at me when you see me in person, but um, what's your... What are your thoughts on electrification? Um, the rise in kind of EVs like from Tesla and like startups like Rivian and Lucid, but also big players like Ford and Chevy and Dodge kind of getting into the play and electrifying like the F-150 and like electric cars becoming more common. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on kind of the whole resurgence of kind of electric vehicles becoming more, more common and like um, the, the trend of that happening? currently yeah i'm not super well versed um i do know a little bit just from my own research about you know possibly having my next vehicle be electric um subaru is coming out uh it's technically going to be the 2023 i think but you know it's cars so it's coming out this year um their new solterra um i think that the car companies are answering a market need essentially I mean, um, you know, we can say as much as we want that they're, you know, in it for all the right reasons, but ultimately I think it's because they want to make money and they're responding, they're responding to a market need um, because people are becoming increasingly more concerned because of all the things that we've talked about tonight about um, the severity and the frequency of, uh, you know, catastrophic weather events, for example, and uh I think that it's definitely very interesting. Uh, I do know, I have a friend that is currently, <laughs> we've actually been discussing um, a company called QuantumScape that makes batteries for electric vehicles. And um, he is an investor in that company. And so he's been asking my opinions about uh, the science behind what they're doing. And they um, are running their company off of the assumption that the lion's share of the new vehicle market as soon as 2025 is going to be electric vehicles. So whether or not that's true, 
uh, I don't know, but it's uh, a market prediction that is being made, so. Perfect, that was an awesome answer. This was an awesome discussion. Um, again, I wanna reiterate for anyone who um, has questions or will have questions later, feel free to send them to us or to Laurel um, and we can get them answered for you.